But yeah, my topic is uh, identity as a driver towards interoperability. And I want to keep it kind of a little bit business agnostic, uh, just bring up some general technical questions and how do we want to do this and what does this actually mean? So one thing that I want to mention, kind of throw it out there, is that nowadays identity is actually becoming sexy. Like, there's a number of identity-based uh, startups that are, that are coming up in the last number of years. Examples, or just good companies, stop, uh, examples being, for example, Sovereign, Civic, Uport, Yolocom, and probably a number of others, that are all trying to sort of reinvent um, digital identity, self-sovereign identity. Reinvent it yet again, because there's been numerous efforts to reinvent digital identity. Now, what, why do we want to reinvent digital identity? Uh, the answer is probably because the, the previous model is kind of broken. Because if it was fine, nobody would want to change it now that we have hyperledgers or sort of new, new advancements in technology. So there were, there were things that were broken, sort of bad, in the, in the previous identity system. And I kind of thought about it a little bit, and I noted down some things that, at least to me, fell wrong in the previous uh, identity systems. And one of the biggest things was that identifiers or your identity, frankly, your data are tightly coupled with the identity provider or the service provider. So if you use Facebook, your data is on Facebook, your identity comes from Facebook. If Facebook goes down, you lose your data, you lose your identity. It's a difficult process to migrate from Facebook to, let's say, Google+. Plus. It's almost impossible, frankly, because Facebook doesn't allow you to export your data, Google+, Plus doesn't allow you to import the profile, and interoperability between the two, you can't add a Google Plus friend when you're on Facebook, you can't message between each other. So there's sort of a, a, a barrier, there are these silos and there's the network effect. And we see problems that, that arise because of this. I mean, a lot of companies, a lot of great initiatives just don't lift off because they don't get the user base. You look at Google Plus, it failed because all of your friends were on Facebook. Nowadays, a lot of people use WhatsApp because their friends don't want to use Telegram or don't want to use Signal or don't want to use Wire. So network effects are another problem that uh, previous identity, identity models, at least the popular ones, enforce. Besides that, um, obviously the vendor lock. Um, but this is kind of, at least to me, this is kind of the, the core problem. And now that we get the chance to reinvent identity, maybe we can look at how we can actually fix those things and, and how can we actually build a model that allows users to interoperate uh, and then actually in, sort of interact with a lot of different identity platforms in, in a way that feels honest and feels great. So, uh, oh, sorry, um, so, and I'm really happy to see that the, the efforts nowadays actually move towards that future. So we see things like the IDs, which are decentralized identifiers, which should be sort of network agnostic, platform agnostic, even application agnostic, some might say. And I think that is a fantastic effort. If that gets in, then it would be possible for my identity to be resolved on a number of blockchains, so it's sort of blockchain agnostic or even protocol agnostic. We see things like um, verifiable claims, which uh, Sovereign now mentioned, which is a W3C effort, it's a W3C standard, and this promises sort of a future where you could, you could assemble one profile on one identity platform on Uport, for example, make a number of verifications and claims, and then ideally in a perfect world when you switch to a different um, operator, when you switch to a different identity platform, those could still be valid. Um, and another great thing that I noticed was that uh, there is this sort of mentality of decoupling data from the application. And a very good example of this is actually Solid. Um, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with this, it's social link data. It, it introduced at least me to the idea that data can be decoupled from the application. That you can create your own data store, you can create your own data, you can have it locally, and then you can download an application and just point it to where your data is. Solid assumes that data is stored in RDF, linked data, serialized in a number of ways, uh, and the application can just understand that. Tap into that, use it, display it. If you got tired of one application, if you got tired of the way that your current social network looks like, you can just swap to another one. The UI is different, but you can still talk to your previous friends, you can still maintain some of the, the posts that you made. So migration and interoperability in this sense is, is really, really high. And to me, interoperability nowadays doesn't mean just that two applications expose a set of APIs and that's, that's it. You can search for my friends on Facebook or you can do some very primitive sort of API-based things. To me, interoperability would, uh, uh, honestly, would feel, I would imagine that to be a system where I could take my identity, take all of my data from one platform, move to another platform, and lose as little value as possible. And now the question actually comes, 
Well, yeah, I, I could move my data. Let's say I have a social network account on one platform. Let's say I have a Yolcom account and I want to move to Uport, or I have a Sovereign account and I want to move to Yolcom. I can take my data because, uh, to a certain extent, if the data is in a standardized format, be that JSONLD, be that RDF, I mean, time I'll take, I'll take RDF XML, anything. If it's standardized or if it's XDI, then I could just import it into the, uh, into the other application and use it. So data portability is, to a certain extent, doable. Now the questions arise, what if I want to move access control policies? Do those have the same representation? Do those look the same? Are those used the same? Well, what if like one year ago I decided to, to give Facebook access to my profile picture when I signed up for chess.com? Will that migrate correctly? What if there's a reputation system in place? For example, I have a number of verifiable claims. Um, people make claims about me. There's an algorithm that displays my reputation. Let, let it be, for example, 100 reputation units. If I move, will that move as well? How much value and how much I actually lose by transferring from one system to another? So I, yeah, I can claim that we are interoperable. We allow data migration. But if the data migration leads to a massive loss of value for me as a user, then it's just unfeasible and fairly quite silly to actually do it. And one thing that I want to point out is yesterday during the workshop, uh, or actually on the first day, we had these key lessons learned and we tried to sort of see what, what do people want, what do people really crave in sort of uh, self-sovereign or digital identity age. And some of them are, are very interesting to me. So for example, one of them is interoperability for a semantic data model. And the second one is semantics is the driver. We need services that convert data from one service to another. So to me, it's obvious that we, we talk about migration on a deeper level. We don't talk about just interoperating in, in terms of APIs. We talk about interoperating as in I could take all of my data, move to a different application, and still get the full set of functionality. So, and I would really like to, to actually complement the efforts that are being done on this. So W3C with uh, verifiable claims, DIDs and DDOs, I think, are a fantastic effort. Um, Social linked data, I think, is a fantastic effort. XDI, RDF, all of that stuff, I think, can, can really help this thing actually catch on. Um, hyperledgers help a lot. I mean, they help because, frankly, building a decentralized identity platform was possible like 10 or 15 years ago, if you think about it. I mean, I have a key pair, you have a key pair. I sign statements about you, you store them somewhere. It was possible. It was not user friendly. It was tough. It was, the entry barrier was high, and it was not very sort of you know, you lose your key, there's a lot of sort of different nitpicks here and there, but it was possible. Hyperledgers make it convenient, because I strongly believe that a lot of users will not sacrifice their current experience. So if they have Facebook, Google, whatever, and something like Yolocom, or Sovereign, or Uport, or Civic comes up, they will not switch. They will not switch because the new platform is somehow magically more transparent. But a lot of the users won't care about this, they won't care that they have more respect for their data. A majority of users won't care. We have a crowd here that will care, and probably a number of people will care, but they won't. What they will care about is features. What they will care about is if this self-sovereign identity solution interacts in a very interesting and empowering way with other solutions that are out there. If it gives you a set of features that Facebook and Google can't do nowadays, that is what will drive users. And to me, sort of interoperability is really a very, very powerful use case for self-sovereign identity. Because, to be frank, centralized identity providers could implement something like, self, like uh, verifiable claims, and so on and so forth. Nowadays, in a centralized manner, and I mean, we probably wouldn't be able to compete with that fully in terms of user experience, friendliness, and so on and so forth, and then speed. If you're based on a hyperledger, there's transaction time, there's transaction costs, there's a lot of sort of things that get in the way, really. So a centralized provider can just make your whole experience a whole lot nicer. So, oh yeah, I see a point there, value JSON LD is RDF. Yeah, so when I said uh, JSON LD, RDF, XML, just serialization formats for RDF, really, so. Um, I want to conclude with the idea that identity is very complex. And there's a lot of ways to do digital identity. There's a lot of ways to do self-sovereign identity. Hyperledger-based public blockchains what Sovereign is doing, and to me that is a valid way to do it. I think that is, a, that is a secure way to do it to a certain extent. But it is a complicated matter, and people who claim that they've solved it entirely are either geniuses or not geniuses. And very often it's one of them. 
So yeah, thank you for your attention, and I hope we will get some nice discussion going on there. Hey, thanks, Anthony. And uh, I have one question, which again does not come from here. There's spe specific questions. Maybe you can answer in, in the chat afterwards. Um, one question is, what do you think is the hardest thing we need to do right now? So basically, there's a lot of things happening, but as you said, the adoption, the centralized uh, services have the, they have the advantage that they can build the experience and the features. And with decentralized systems and self-sovereign identity, we everybody kind of needs to do their own thing and start to invent their own thing, the features, and we, we're not sure how the adoption works. So. Um, how do you see, what is the most difficult thing to make this uh, adopted, get this adopted? So I think any startup, any company that works in the areas of self-sovereign identity nowadays will have a lot of heat with user experience. Shout out to any UX designers out there who work for a company like that, your life is hell. Because costs, if you do it on a public blockchain, costs associated with things. You have to, you have to get users used to the fact that they might have to pay for things. You might have to get users used to the fact that they will have to wait 10 minutes if you do it on Bitcoin or 24 seconds or whatever for their transaction to go through, that it might be reversed. <coughs> that, and all of these things are really, really quite, quite tough. And I had a discussion about UX and UI uh, yesterday. And then the idea is that nowadays UX and UI tries to be as sleek, as minimalistic as possible. But when you introduce the users to blockchains or to self-sovereign identity, there's a ton of test, you have, a ton of stuff you have to tell them. And that's a really, really difficult thing to do, frankly. So, I think to me that is one of the biggest problems. Yeah, I believe we do need those kind of interpreters of sorts. That there's a lot of steps still from the core of what we're working right now to the actual end users using the system, and there are still multiple steps. And I do fully agree that that's that's going to be really yeah. hard. And one quick remark. Uh, also, it's tough to be transparent about things because you know you might say that you are doing a self-sovereign decentralized identity platform. Um, the truth is, building a fully 100% self-sovereign decentralized identity platform is possible based on a hyperledger, for example, but it's not going to be very use usable. I mean, it'll be usable, but it'll be a little bit tough for the users. You'll lose a lot of users. Uh, ideally, you would want to self-host. Ideally, you'd want to deploy your own service, have your data there. So, <laughs> you have to strike a balance between self-sovereign and some centralized aspects. And you, you have to find a balance that you feel comfortable at and you have to feel comfortable coming up in front of people and describing your product. And, and to me, that's a little bit difficult to find that balance between giving the user full control over their data and self-sovereignty and, and still providing a user-friendly experience. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I mean, wonderful thoughts. Okay, let's give a applause to you.